Hello everyone, it's Kevin here again, and today we're going to be going over some week two items. So this week we're going to be going over some of the basics of Dart, the programming language. So just to clear up any misconceptions, Flutter is the framework. Flutter is uh, what's used to create this UI. It's what has all the widgets, all those libraries, all the nice stuff that we use for creating these beautiful cross-platform UIs, and Dart is the programming language. If you have any experience with uh, C-sharp development, it'd be kind of like XAML as your markup language, and then uh, C-sharp as your language for the code behind for the logic. Now, that's not exactly true, right? There, it's, it's not a direct parallel there because uh, Flutter doesn't actually use a markup language. Flutter uses um, Dart itself, so it just everything's an object. Every single UI element is an object. It's a it's an instantiation of a class that already exists in uh, the Flutter framework. However, I do like to make that comparison because that's the, that's an easy way for for me to relate that to someone who maybe hasn't touched any anything like Flutter quite yet. So, I could jump right into uh, this logic, but I I know that I haven't gone over formally quite yet how to create a new project. So what you would do is you would select any location, any directory. In this case, it would be users, uh, R-I-C-K-E, desktop, and then this is where I'm going to be creating that this project. So you can you can add it anywhere. The only caveat, or maybe that's not the right word, but the only thing that I would warn against is uh, selecting a directory that's not protected, that doesn't have any right protections. So C, uh, program files, I don't think... Sh it, it might have some protection. I, I think it depends on the machine. So C, just your C directory that may have some. It may not. It depends on your machine. But just make sure that you uh, select something that doesn't have that rate protection. So in this case, what I would do is I would just go and create a new folder. I would name this folder uh, projects, flow like Flutter projects. And then I'll open up this folder. I'll go ahead and open a git bash window. Now, it's not going to give me the option here, but I could open it in git bash by just pulling up git bash here and then pasting this into that git bash, just changing directory. I'll go over some useful uh, terminal commands for git bash, but you could also just do this, open in terminal, and you could use some of the necessary commands. This, at this point, I would expect you to already have Flutter installed, to have an Android virtual device installed and operational. Uh, those are some of the requirements for this video. If you're not there yet, go ahead and meet those requirements first, so go and look it up. I did provide a video on the D2L page for the course. Uh, feel free to reach out, though, if you need any help with that. So I'm going to go ahead and use Git Bash. If you don't have Git Bash installed, you're going to want to get that installed eventually. We're not going to go over Git quite yet in this video. We will eventually within the next few weeks once we start working on some of the group projects. But I'm going to go ahead and use Git Bash because I do prefer Git Bash. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this. I'm going to do a CD just to change directory. Open quote there paste the path into it, close that. We're in this directory now. We can also determine what is in this directory by doing an ls command. There we go, nothing's in the directory, as expected. Next, we would create a project. So we would enter Flutter, F-L-U-T-T-E-R. <laughs> of course, I misspelled it. Create, like that, C-R-E-A-T-E. -E. I know it sounds silly that I'm spelling it out loud, but I don't know, it might help someone out there. And then the name of the project. I believe there are some restrictions with how you can name the project. In general, I like to do a lowercase uh, to start with. So week two lecture. That's what I would name it. Okay, see? So that's not a valid that's not a valid uh, package name. So we'll do week two lecture with out to capital. Oh, whoops, of course. And looks like it did like that. So perhaps camel case with uh, capital in there doesn't like. But uh, as the directions state here, change directory to your project location. And here we would just do CD. Now we can do this. We can go ahead and do this. Or we can go ahead and open it the way that I did here. So double click in that folder. Right click. 
and go ahead and open with code. If you don't have this option, uh, you may have to go and make some changes into your registry. That should just be a quick Google search away. If you do have it here, go ahead and select this. If you don't, you can open up Visual Studio Code and uh, go ahead and open the folder from here. So open folder as you see in the file area. Open folder and then select the folder that you would like to open. In this case, it'd be in here. We're not going to do that since it is already here. So once you get here to run the project, you would open up a new terminal. See if I can find it. There you go. By mistake. So view and then select new terminal under view. Ensure that your terminal is in the correct directory. You can also do an ls here again. Verify that all the items are in there. And then what we would do from here is we would do flutter run. This assumes that you have already opened up Android Studio, which is on this page. You have already selected AVD Manager, Android Virtual Device Manager. You have already selected your Android Virtual Device, and you've already hit play to start up your Android Virtual Device. If you've not done that yet, go ahead and do that now. Once your Android Virtual Device is running, go ahead and enter Flutter Run. And it shows up down here. So I'm not going to do this because I don't need this project. I have another project where I have all the, uh, I have our, all the logic written. So I'm just going to go ahead and go over that one. So here's the project. I'm not going to get too uh, too much into the weeds of debugging, but just so that you all can follow along, because we, we will cover debugging for an, uh, during an entire week later on in the semester. So I may use a few items here, and you can feel free to look into it and use them, but we're not going to formally cover debugging using, uh, using Visual Studio Code until later on in the semester. So in this case, nothing's running here, which is perfect. And let's go to here. Looks like we already have an instance running. As you can tell, it's orange down here. But this is what I would do. So if you don't have this option yet, select Run, and then select Start Debugging. If you would not like to debug, if you just want to run the application and uh, do hot reload at any time, that's totally fine. Open up your terminal and do Flutter Run as such but you will not have debugging. You need to go ahead and set up a debugging configuration in order to be able to do that. So once you have this set up, in my case it's already running, we can go to our debug console. I'll click on here, I'll set a breakpoint to actually. Go ahead and save, so control S to save. It'll do its uh, changes. I'll hit plus, boom, our breakpoint hits here. Let's check the value of this variable. That is accurate. We assigned 55 at this point. Let's check the value of this variable. That is also accurate. So to begin, Dart is a null safe um, programming language. It's developed by Google and it's, it's quite similar to JavaScript. There are many similarities. There are a few differences. If you've written any JavaScript code, this should be somewhat familiar. Now the typing, notice the typing here. That is one difference. So if you're familiar with TypeScript, that is one similarity where it's, it's got the typing. We'll get into the null safety, into the null coalescing, the null conditionals, all of that other stuff later on in this video. Just be aware that it's very similar to JavaScript, except it has typing and it has null safety. I really like this programming language because of those two reasons. JavaScript, just vanilla JavaScript. If you're not aware, vanilla JavaScript means JavaScript with no additional libraries or frameworks like React. It's not vanilla JavaScript. Um, TypeScript is not vanilla JavaScript. That's a superset of JavaScript. It adds on top of JavaScript. So this, like I said, it's not exactly like JavaScript, but it's very similar. It's a lot of times that I just said JavaScript. So variable assignment, let's jump right into that. So it actually, before I even get into that, I'm sorry. Uh, what is this? So this increment counter, we're not gonna get too much into the weeds of actually writing logic for uh, your Flutter application quite yet. We'll be doing this throughout the entire course. Uh, this video, like I said, will just go over the programming language. So if we look at this increment counter, let's look at this here, instantiation of a floating action button object. It has a couple properties, unpressed, 
tooltip and child. Notice how the on pressed has a function here. This function is defined up here a uh, couple hundred lines up. But basically, this is the uh, this is what's being called. Every time that we hit this button, every time that this on pressed event is fired off, this method is invoked. Method function. I should jump jump into that here real quick. So whenever I say function, whenever I say method, typically referring to the same thing, it's some defined routine, some defined set of instructions of operations that the application is gonna go is gonna go and execute. So if I say function, if I say method, I work in C sharp day to day. That's what I do for a living. So if I say method, forgive me. I believe that the uh, proper terminology is function. So that is how this is being invoked. This event happens. So by clicking on this we are invoking this here function. So let's go right back up here and we get to here. If I set a breakpoint here and I set this button and I hit this button, I'm sorry, and I actually save, I gotta save here as well. We hit this here logic and we can go ahead and step over, step through, step into, so on and so forth. But what matters is that this logic is hit when that button is pressed on the UI side. In other words, this method is invoked, this function is invoked. Essentially synonymous things. So we have what's known as var. Var is your, it's, it's not, no type is defined. It's, the type is set whenever you set something equal to this variable. So it's just like JavaScript, where if you have a var, it can just equal anything. Now, in JavaScript, you have lets, L-E-T, and then you have a var. So there is a difference there between the scope of those two with this, the scope is this here function. So keep that item in mind. We're not going to be able to access this item outside of this void function increment counter. Uh, one other quick item: if you see this underscore, this is very common. Uh, this is very common naming convention, at least in C sharp and in Flutter. So if you ever see this underscore in a lowercase, that typically means it's a private. So it's a private uh, function that's only going to be. It's a member. It's a private member of this here class. So it's not going to be able to be accessed by an outside class. Just recall from your object-oriented uh, programming, your intro to programming logic, I believe the course is at St. Cloud Technical and Community College. Uh, just recall the variable scope stuff. If you don't remember, just a quick re, uh, reintroduction. Basically, private. Even though we're not explicitly defining this as private, by doing this, we are essentially letting the developer know this is private. Uh, this is not to be accessed from the outside of its capital as such. And actually, in this case, we have that underscore. But uh, let's see, like here, since it's capital, this can be accessed and invoked by other classes. So now that I'm over with that tangent, we have our explicit primitives. So our integer type is just the way it sounds it's an integer we can't assign a floating point value because that would not be allowed you know IntelliSense will help you and you'll notice that uh, IntelliSense helps a lot so you can select you can hover over select quick fix and it'll be able to give you a couple nice things it's not sometimes they're not too useful other times they are quite useful so just keep that in mind so our integer is just an integer we can see some uh, details here. So here are our ranges for these integers. We have our doubles, which is just a double precision floating point. So as this here says, I'm, I apologize if I have some typos here. Uh, just disregard those typos. But um, basically, uh, double is just a double precision floating point number. So we can assign decimals, basically. That is different from a decimal, by the way. A decimal in Java or in any other programming language or I'm I'm probably thinking in C-sharp, so double and decimal, different things, but in operation, basically, uh, it serves, this is the same thing, it's a decimal number, a number that has decimal points. A string is, a, is an array of characters, kind of like in C++, or, or I'm probably thinking C language, but in our case, it's just string. Notice how it implements, it inherits from comparable of type string. Uh, and this other here uh, class. So some more details here. Also keep in mind that these here uh, little explanations are very useful. Has a lot of very useful items for us to go and use. So basically a string we can assign any string to it. The reason I say 
array of characters. You'll see later on why I say that, because we can access uh, any position in the string. So string position zero. Say so we go ahead and do defined string position zero. That's doable, right? That's something that you can get. In this case, uh, defined string position zero would be S, character S. Boolean flag. So bool is just a boolean. Uh, true or false? Basically, that's it. I'll get into the nullability into the nullability later on. That's all that matters for now. So I'm gonna get rid of this. We can house. We can also have final. So basically, this is kind of like a constant. There you go. That even tells us right there. Use constant for final variables. Initialize with a constant value. You could also replace it with const, as such. But uh, basically, it's something that won't change throughout the program runtime. And if you do try to change it. It's not allowed because it is constant. So this would be useful where, like, uh, let's think of a good example. So if you're developing this IDE, this integrated development environment, which is just Visual Studio Code, and you want to, so let's let's think of one area where something is reused several times. Or I could even go on the home screen of this here virtual device if it lets me. If not, we'll just not worry about that so right here debug console we may have different areas where debug console shows up we may have areas up here where it shows up we may have areas in the settings where it shows up but the string is going to be the same it's always going to be the same it's always going to be debug console and if we want to change it we could do control shift F and search every search for every single instance of debug console now I don't have the, the source code for Visual Studio Code since uh, this is open source. We can look into it and probably find it. We're not going to do that for this course. But uh, instead of doing a find and replace all, where we might target different strings that we don't want to actually change, where debug console might not want to be targeted in some certain spot, we could assign it to a constant. So for example here, generic widget title, that might be used throughout the entire application. Rather than changing it several times in the application, we can just replace the, uh, the what do you call it, the constant. So we can have a constants class, and we can just call that class and use that. So like constant class dot generic widget title is where we would use that any time that we want to reference that title. That's where that's pretty useful. Uh, concatenation and interpolation. I'm going to go ahead and place this right back here. Save, and basically I'm going to set a breakpoint right here. Hit this button. We hit this here part. So string first name is assigned a value of Doge. String string last name is a va uh, assigned a value of Coin. You may see this a lot. It's not that I have any particular interest in crypto or anything. It's just uh, you may see Fizz, Buzz. You may see Foo, F O O B A R, uh, Dolphin, Sandwich, whatever. It's just filler. Think of it as like lorem ipsum. Not exactly the same, but think of it as something just just to fill basically. So notice how we can combine two strings via concatenation where we use the plus operator, the addition operator in this case. We step over, notice how the value of Dogecoin, of, of variable full name is now Dogecoin because we concatenated these here two variables. Another thing that we can do is uh, notice here how there is no space between these two. We can do what's called string interpolation. So notice the value of first name is still here. Uh, notice the, not not literally here, but notice that the value of last name, if it lets me hover over it. Okay, it's not letting me, but same deal here. Here's the variable that we're referencing, Dogecoin. Full name is currently Dogecoin because that's what we assigned to it earlier. Step over that. Go back up here. Come on. I'm going to go ahead and print that line. If we want to print to the console, we just do print. All right, I'm going to go ahead and look into this real quick, make sure that uh, not running into any issues. I apologize for that. I had to restart the application. I didn't actually make any changes. If I hover over this, though, we notice that uh, the space is included. So string interpolation basically is a way to interpolate, throw the variables into a string. 
So here is the string. We go ahead and uh, create the open and closed quotes. We use a dollar sign and we put the variable in there. Now, one quick thing, if we want to do some array access here, so dollar sign, last name again, position zero, uh, two, there may be some issues with that. I have noticed that there are some issues with that. Um, so that's just one quick item to keep in mind. Uh, if that is the case and you want to access a specific element, you can just do this. And that also works just fine. Just uh, be sure to include your spaces and your uh, concatenation operators. In this case, for the string, I'm going to get rid of this since we don't need this. If we want to do a multi-line comment, I'll just place this right here. Let this continue. And honestly, that may have been why it caused an issue because I was sitting there making some code changes. Then must not like that. Could be it. Uh, so if we want to do a multi-line comment, we do three uh, just single quotes and then another three single quotes. That's pretty interesting. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, make sure that that is one difference between this and JavaScript. You need to use a semicolon just like in C Sharp or Java. You need to. So once we covered this, this is pretty straightforward, just multi-line comments. Uh, conditions, so it's just like JavaScript or C Sharp. If condition, then execute this logic. Else, execute this other logic. Notice how IntelliSense tells us that this will never be reached. It's dead code. It just knows. It's pretty interesting, pretty, pretty useful stuff. It seems obvious now, but once you're working with uh, you know, several million line code, uh, code base, it's a lot more useful. We then get into the ternary operator. It's pretty useful. This is actually extremely important, especially for Flutter. The reason is because whenever we're working with our UI, such as down here, if you want to display something, we can display, we can display this here. If so let's see here. True. So if, if the condition is true, display this. Else uh, text widget with whatever properties that you want to add in there. Not actually going to add them because we're not going to need them. But once again, whenever you see like this here, just a defined, just a Boolean value, so true or false. If it's in the beginning of the course, I'm just referring to this as any condition. So this could be like uh, some variable ABC is equal to 10, right? Or some a variable a, some variable ABC or some ba uh, variable DEF. The result of that is what we'll assign, what, what we'll take for that ternary operator. So to get into a couple more details up here for the ternary operator, we basically have... A so we'll get to the booleans actually real quick. So I'll define a boolean A, define a boolean B, and boolean A has a value of true, boolean B has a value of false. So A and B, this will be false. So true and false will be false. So the false block of this, so this is the true block, typically just a single liner. The false block is what will be executed here. Notice that IntelliSense helps us out a little here too. So that's where that shows up. It'll show up a lot. Get used to it. Notice here, I do have a little cheat sheet. If the condition, the true value is this here, if, uh, is where the true value logic will be added. And this here is where the false value logic will be added. We can also define a function and then throw that function in here. That way we can do multi lines. Or uh, we can, yeah, there's, there's several things. You could just stick with a single line. We'll get into the anonymous functions and the uh, other related functions later on here. So now that we've been through that, we'll get into the Boolean logic, some of the basic Boolean logic. Okay, so it actually here, why don't we go ahead and print this here? So if true, print it's true, else print it's false, notice it's true. And here, print. A and B. So the result of this is going to be false. So it should print coin. As we can tell, that's exactly what it prints. If we change this to A or B, it'll print this because true or false is equal to true. 
notice how IntelliSense updates immediately. Very nice. Very useful here. So here's some Boolean logic. We have some Boolean X assigned value of true, some Boolean Y assigned a value of false. X and Y, what's the value of that going to be? True and false, going to give us a false or value. X or Y, so true or false is going to give us a value of true. And we'll just set a breakpoint around right here, save and execute. So false, true, not X, the value of X is true, so the opposite of true is false. And that's what we get. We can have some compound conditions as well. So the value of Boolean compound conditions can be X and Y, which is true, and, I'm sorry, or X or Y, where X is true and Y is false. That's true. So true and true, oh, I'm sorry, false or true. I was looking a little further here. So false or true. So this here, true is going to give us a value of true and the value of x is true it should give us a final value of true step over that there we go value of true and we'll print that to the console here we go if you do run into some issues while i'll go right back up here if you run into any issues while making a code change just go ahead and stop your instance of your, de your debug instance and restart it or stop your uh, production instance and restart it something to keep in mind. Looping structures, this should be something you're all very familiar with. Get into the loops here. So we have our while loops. So we'll assign a value of zero to an integer counter. While the counter is less than 10, we're gonna increment the counter and then we're gonna print the value of the counter. And then we'll, we'll get the output in a little bit here. We also have do while loops. So first this is gonna execute, then we're gonna check the condition. So we're going to increment the while counter right away. We're going to print if the value is divisible by, if the while counter is divisible by two and has a remainder of zero, which means that uh, if it's divisible by two and it has a remainder of zero, it means it's even. And then if it has any remainder, that means it's not even. So if that's true, divisible by zero, else not divisible by zero, pretty straightforward. And we also get into the for loops as well. So basically four, and then your initial value, integer i is equal to zero, and then i, what we're gonna go to, less than, so we can do less than, less than, or equal to, just like Java, and then what we're gonna increment by. So this could be increment by one, increment by 10, whatever you want it to be. And then we have the logic inside of the loop. So if I hit this here, you can tell here, when it's divisible by zero, not divisible by zero, here's some of that logic from the do while and the while loop. And, Here's the for loop, basically, going through all the values. Pretty straightforward stuff, just like any other programming language. However, this does serve a second purpose. We'll get into that as well once we get past the lists, but this is also equivalent to your for each. We will get into that in a second here. So we also have lists. So you may be used to arrays in uh, Flutter here, not Flutter, I'm sorry, in Dart, we use lists of type primitive, of type object. We'll get into the complex types later on. But uh, in this case, it's a list of type primitive. We can add values to a list. We can sort the list. We can remove a value from the list. Just go ahead and uh, it, I'll show you a little, little cool trick here. So we'll create the list. We'll assign some values to this list. And say we want to go and find out which methods we can use, which functions we want to use in this list. We just do the name of the list, user IDs, dot, boom. Here's a couple of our options. So you have list.length, we'll give you, which will give you the length of the list, list.first, which will give you the first item in the list, list.last, list. a list whole bunch of other stuff here. Very, very useful. You can also convert it to a map. Uh, like I said, quite a useful list. I'm sorry, quite a useful um, <clears throat> feature here in Visual Studio Code. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. So here is our instance of doing basically a for each. So we're going to go and define what that element is going to be, the element inside of the list. So variable this. Now this also could be since user IDs is, uh, us the user IDs list is of type integer. So we could just have this be int and that'll also work fine. I like to do var because that's dynamic. It can be anything. So basically, we'll go through this 
through each iteration we'll print the value of this if we set a breakpoint here save it does not there we go if you ever get that circle like that try reclicking if that doesn't work stop your solution start it back up should work fine after that I'm gonna go ahead and try saving see if it wants if that's all it wants alright it's not wanting so I'll stop this hit run and debug again okay there we go there's so there's some build errors and looks like I forgot to add my uh, end quote so that's pretty useful here by the way problems we'll give you a couple we'll give you some pretty useful information so if you click on it it'll tell you exactly where the problem is expected to find this but it didn't get it uh, expected to find this identifier didn't get it so pretty useful stuff if I set our begin comment out here block comment right there that's should work hit start out here run a debug go ahead and let this start up go back to our debug console so we can see the output oh alright now it's opening it up So, if I hit this breakpoint and we look at the value of, we look at what's here in the console, we will see that uh, here's some of the stuff that we printed out. So, if we see here 23 matches with that final element, 3 matches with that second to last, 5, 1, so on and so forth. If we add a value to this list, step over here, look at the value and looks like it did get added properly in position number four we can also see it in our variables once again not a super in-depth explanation of how to debug uh, but it is useful to use so I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this breakpoint we can also sort the list so at this point it's unsorted so we go through here get rid of this set it there And if we look here, we went ahead and sorted it. I'll set a breakpoint there. So at this point, 1, 5, 3, 23, 20. It's unsorted. If we step over, I don't want to step into this loop, so I'm just going to go ahead and set a breakpoint here and continue. And perfect. That did exactly what I didn't want it to do. But if we look here, it's now sorted. So there's a couple functions that we can use of list. Again, just write the variable and start typing, or just write the variable name, hit a dot, and you'll get some of the sub methods or sub uh, public uh, functions that you can call. So, similar to a list, similar logic for any list, as I mentioned here. So, in C sharp, you'll see this here. Uh, you'll see this here a lot. So, something of type T, where T is anything. Same deal here. Uh, we can have a list of type primitive, we can have a list of type non-primitive. So in this case we have a list of type super user. And we could also create a list of type base user. Now, right back to the real good stuff. This is the meat and potatoes of uh, Dart. This is where it really gets strong. So I'm going to go ahead and F12. That's another quick useful trick. Continue out of this because we don't need that. If you click on something and you hit your F12 button. In my case, I'm on a laptop, so I gotta hit the function key and then F12. It'll bring you right to the definition. It's phenomenal, very useful stuff. So go ahead and take advantage of that. So, okay, we have our class base user, which has a couple variables, integer age, string name, string username. These are public, assume that these are public, so they're public instance members. And here, base user, this is the constructor. There's no actual logic in base user, it just serves as an object model model to represent something that exists so a lot of the times if you look at tutorials if you uh, go and research on your own you'll hear somebody say oh yeah class represents stuff like a minecraft block which has you know n sides and it has this and that like yeah that's not you know or a class cat or a class dog 
I mean, I don't like those comparisons because, yeah, we get it. A cat has four legs, has one tail, can have multiple colors like that. But how does that actually relate? When am I going to be creating a cat in code? I'm not going to. What I'm going to be creating is I'm going to be creating users. I'm going to be creating credit card objects. I'm going to be creating uh, bank accounts, right? We're going to take this. We, we need structured information so that we can store it inside of our database. If we go back to database, so again, at SETCC, St. Cloud Technical and Community College, you take database modeling one and two. So in database modeling one and two, you go over ERDs, entity relational diagrams. These entity relational diagrams will have a list of attributes. So you have your table name, which for example, might be base user, and you have a list of attributes, which might be age, name, and username. So th those attributes have to be brought into the uh, client side programming language that you're working on. Now, if you're working with JavaScript, you don't have to do that, I guess. But in this case, since this is a typed language, you do have to do that. So these serve as in they, these serve as an object model. I think that's a really good name because it takes into consideration that it's an object in memory and that it's a model of something that exists in real life. So a base user exists. That base user has an age, name, and a username. Credit card has a card number, has a name on card, it has an address, it has a zip code, very, uh, various associated properties. That's another name that you may hear. Properties, uh, member variables, because these are members of this class. So keep that in mind, very important stuff. Should just be review, but if you've gotten this far and you didn't realize that, well, welcome to the world of object-oriented programming. That's how it really comes in. Now the other items such as abstraction, polymorphism, inheritance, so on and so forth, these items also come into play as well. They're not quite as common. However, you should be familiar with what each one of those are. What will be most important here is inheritance. So notice how super user extends class base user. It basically inherits, right, on, in quotes, it inherits the properties of base user. So super user will have properties that came out of base user. Now it does have these additional properties that do not exist in class base user, which are is developer and is administrator. So super user, we assign some of the values so that we can fill up the stuff for the base user we also need to go ahead and fill up the values for the uh, super user. We also have our super keyword, which is just as it sounds, it's, it's just like in Java. So this is how you can assign the values to, for your uh, base class. And I have this here, this uh, member function, which basically just returns if the name of that instance, right? Just because remember, every time that you create a super user object in memory, it has its own local members. So say I do super user, user is equal to new super user, and I add the values inside of it. We'll do that up here. And I do that again, and then I do that again. Each one of those is unique. Each one of those has some memory location where it's stored. So developer is unique for that instance of super user. It can be in memory location 0x55 FFFF, whatever. And that's specific for this or from beginning memory location to ending memory location you guys all understand what I mean I would hope if you don't review some of your structured programming logic and your other courses that you've taken so far so basically boolean is Benji notice how the definition of this function we'll get into function definitions a little later but just a quick peek this is the return type, this is the name of the function and this is the logic inside of the function we're gonna go ahead and return if the instance member to lowercase, which as you can tell here converts all the characters into string to lowercase, contains, so at this point, the, val the value of name is whatever name is, but all lowercase, and we're going to check if that contains Benji. So we can do this, we can compound uh, methods or functions. So we'll go right back up here. Notice how I create a list of type super user, a list of type complex, non primitive. Super user consists of several primitives, but super user itself is not a primitive. Recall that a primitive is anything, <laughs> I guess it's kind of hard to use, uh, kind of hard to, de to define primitive without actually using the word primitive, but basically any, any sort of uh, value that's an integer, a double, a floating point, which is just a float, and a string. Although string, I believe, is a class itself in, in uh, Flutter. But basically, remember our constructor, if we go in F12 into this, here's a constructor, 
look at the values. They all correlate with that constructor. So I'm going to go back just by using the back button on my mouse. And we assign an age of 21, name of Doge, another name of Dogecoin, value of true, and another value of true. We do this several times, and we can do a for each or for this value, this uh, unique index in this list. And we're going to print if, it, if it's Benji. So basically, is Benji, and we're going to go take the super user, which is here. We're going to invoke the method, or the function, I'm sorry, is Benji. If the value is true, we're going to print true. If the value is false, we're going to print false. Let's see what we get here. I'm going to help go ahead and save, hit this button. And is Benji false? Is Benji? It's also false. And notice, sometimes Dart will do this. Uh, is Benji also false for this one because Benji is not in here. However, the last one is Benji is true because Benji is in here. If you're curious about where Benji comes from, that's the name of one of my pets. So maps, keep in mind, very important, maps are not indexed. It's not like a dictionary of type uh, T comma T in uh, C sharp where T is just any type. Uh, map is it's it's very similar to it's very similar to a dictionary in C sharp, or even an expando object or a J object. Really, it's closer to a J object where it's like JSON, where it's just key value pairs. So you can think of a you can think of a map uh, as a list of key value pairs. Notice here the definition: dynamic, dynamic. So the first so the key is of dynamic type and the value is of dynamic type. What that means is we can create a map and we can assign anything to this. So we can assign a primitive string into the key. We, I'm sorry, to the value. Notice this is the key, this is the value. We can assign another primitive. We could also do primitive and primitive, but in this case, it's uh, T. So here it's T and T. Here it's T and uh, Y, for example, right? These are not the same type. Here, again, Y comma T. Not the same type, totally acceptable here. We can also add in an instance of an object right here. So this is an element of super user, of list super users. So this would be this here, notice position number one. And the value is a super user. So if we go ahead and set this here, save and print, it'll just, okay, so that's perfect. It'll tell us that it's an instance of super user. If we do key dot, we're going to run into some issues here because since it's dynamically typed, we don't actually know. We know, right, we know exactly here because we defined it here, but if we're taking in some input payload from an API, we're not going to know uh, what type it is until we cast it or parse it. So we're not going to go and do key dot, you know, some method because it's not going to show up. It's dynamically typed. Uh, but that's why it tells us instance of super user. If we set a breakpoint here, though, hit this button, we're going to go through that one, so that's position 0, which would be doge, position 1, which would be doge 1. I'm sorry, I was looking up here, not down there. Um, so doge, this is item, this is 555, five, five. so the next one should be 555, five, five. gets it printed, and then super user. So if we look at this key, we're going to notice it's super user, and here's some of the properties of super user. Going to go ahead and step over that. It'll tell us it's an instance of super user. Now, notice that element access. So, if we want to access any element of a map, it runs an O of 1 time complexity. If you're not familiar with time complexity yet, we'll get into that later in the semester. What this means in layman's terms is that whether that map has 1 million, 100 million, 100 trillion elements, if you want to access any key, it's relatively constant time. So say it takes n milliseconds to access a key from any map. Regardless of the size of that map, it's going to take n milliseconds, plus or minus some variation. Depends on the programming language, depends on your CPU, depends on your RAM, so on and so forth. But uh, for all intents and purposes, it's going to be of constant time. If we go down here, if we want to go and access a value from a dictionary, or I'm not from a dictionary, I'm sorry, from a map, we can go ahead and do the name of the variable, position, key. If you do this, you'll get null. So 
you what I suggest doing is checking if the key exists always check if the key exists if you're taking a payload from an API or you're trying to read something that might be there but it might also not be there because if you have a null reference exception that's a problem you want to you want to handle that we'll get into handling nullables uh, later on in here but basically right now you're going to want to check if it contains the key if it does contain the key go ahead and print it so here since key value pairs does have a key of doge we're going to go ahead and prevent or not prevent we're going to go ahead and print the value of key value pairs position doge which should be coin if we go down here set a breakpoint that's actually not going to do anything so i'm just going to save and we'll see the value notice coin gets printed in the console relatively straightforward lambda expressions so lambda expressions and anonymous functions these are useful they're very they're very um, important also in dart and flutter we have there should be one example here right here here's an anonymous function i'm sorry not an anonymous uh, lambda expression so that's the case where you would use it so for this here you would execute my page state you would expect to hit this logic when this is invoked I'm gonna just make sure that my video is still going that all looks perfect I just want to avoid having to remake the video huh <laughs> alright so notice here the uh, output of variable result is a is, it's, it's an anonymous function which takes in some parameters so a parameterized anonymous function uh, basically parameters P parking spot that's what gets put in here argument a auto is what goes into so one and two are the arguments uh, but the parameters themselves are a and B if that makes sense that's how I like to remember it P parameter parking spot a argument auto so in this case if we go ahead and invoke this here anonymous function the value one comma two we're gonna add them together and we expect to see three here so if I set a uh, breakpoint here and probably want to go ahead and place that there set a breakpoint there and the value is three as we would expect here's an instance of a lambda parameterized lambda lambda nonetheless so in this case we would want to I'm just gonna go ahead and continue here this case we would want to print the value of what this lambda is going to be notice it's a function it returns an integer and the value is just going to be a plus b again once again one plus two should be three I'm going to go ahead and save set that breakpoint hit the breakpoint step over step over again all right why don't I set breakpoint lower down, or not a breakpoint, move this a little bit lower down. Save again, see if it wants to do that, there we go. Alright, run into something, I'm going to go ahead and stop and start it again. So I'm going to go ahead and pause this. I can get to this I apologize for okay I apologize for that couldn't find it so I'm gonna go ahead and pause again I apologize my mistake notice here it says two so two instances of three got that again um, wasn't actually a problem so we're gonna go ahead and continue here this is still this is perfect where we're at right now so we have what's known as a nullability operator what the nullability operator means is basically this variable this primitive in this case can be null It doesn't have to be null it can be defined it can be set anywhere but it can be null so basically we define it here as a nullable so we assign a value of true that's fine 
we assign a value of null, that's also fine. Again, value of true, fine. Again, a value of null, that's also fine. Notice, if I try to assign, because here I create a new variable, non-nullable flag. If I get rid of this here block, notice how this is not allowed. The reason is because it's uh, you can't assign a null to a non-nullable. So what we can do is we can use what's known as a null coalescing operator. It's uh, two question marks. If you work in C-sharp, it's the exact same thing. So what this basically says, it, it's, it's just shorthand. That's all it is. So this is equivalent to non-nullable flag is equal to, and actually we're not going to want to do that. We're going to want to do nullable flag if nullable flag equals true. We assign to this here variable, non-nullable flag, else, same thing as that, but notice that this, take, this takes from 212 to 218. If we save, yeah, it'll go ahead and compact it a little bit, but that's still not as good as a single liner. So all this does is it basically says if this value is not null, assign the value as long as that as long as the defined variable matches. So basically this is not nullable as long as they're the same other than the nullability other than the non nullability operator. I'm sorry. Uh, assign that to this non nullable variable. If it is null, assign a value of false or assign a value of whatever. So we could also have string val is equal to uh, go ahead and create another one here. Okay. Nullable val is equal to test and add a nullable there. We can do this. <coughs> Sorry if I uh, misspelled that, but basically, notice it's nullable. And okay, maybe the string class allows it. Let's do int. Whatever, you all get what I mean. If you try running this at runtime, you'll assign a note. So I guess it, it's not actually gonna. Maybe it's because we don't uh, read this value, but if it is, or maybe it's the IntelliSense knowing that, okay, it's defined even though it's nullable. However, if this is grabbed from an API or from some location where it may be nullable and you assign it to a non-nullable, it may give you IntelliSense an IntelliSense warning. If not, make sure that you handle that nullability. So do that. Should be able to do that. Okay, left hand operand can't be null because we explicitly define it here, but you all get what I mean. I would hope. <clears throat> if we move down, we can do some exception handling. So here, for example, I'm going to go ahead and save at this point. Set a breakpoint here. If this 0 over 0 is going to throw an exception, Step over that. That's perfect. Exactly what I wanted it to do. <laughs> okay, must not be hitting this logic. I want to go ahead and stop here, figure out why it's not working perfectly. Okay, I'm back. So it, w it didn't assign a value of null. It assigned a value of nan, N-A-N. So I apologize if my headset was all the way up. I, I moved my headset down, so if, if it was a little quiet, I apologize for that. So the value is N-A-N at this point. I'm going to set a breakpoint here. This button and save. So value of division. Result is NAN, not null. Didn't throw an exception either. Um, so that's why it wasn't getting to this point basically. But if the value is NAN, gonna step over that. It's gonna throw that error and it's gonna catch the exception. 
So what I did here is I created a mock database. If we F12 into this, we're going to notice that mock class mock database has a value connection string, a string value connection string. Have the uh, constructor here. And then we have two functions here that return a future of type bool. We'll get into this in a little bit, but basically uh, it's a nullable boolean. And the name of the function here is rate error to table. It's going to take in a string error and it's going to return uh, a value of true, but it's, it's, it's going to return an awaitable value of true. We'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, same deal for mock rate to table. This is essentially what you will see when you go and make a call to an API. You're going to create your API. So you're going to instantiate your API as you saw up there. You're going to fill the API or pass in whatever context it needs. And then you're going to go and invoke a function of that API class. So notice how I create this here uh, class database. And then I fill it with a connection string, as that's what the constructor takes in. It takes in a, a connection string. It doesn't actually do anything, but it'll, it's, it's a perfect mock because it this is exactly how you would do a database as well, assuming that you have all the necessary libraries in your project. So we're going to write to the table. We're going to pass in the exception, uh, the two-string representation of the exception. And it does return, notice, it does return a, uh, it's not going to show us if I hover over because we're in the middle of runtime, but if we look here, it returns a future of type bool. We don't have to take that future of type bool. In some programming languages, the, the proper thing to do is to um, use a discard. So underscore is equal to whatever. It might be the version that I'm using. It might not be, uh, but it's not going to take that discard. So it's fine if we don't assign it to anything. Step over that. Good to go. What that would do, though, in that case, is it would log that error to the database. That's something that you typically want to do. You want to log your errors. So the reason that you want to do that <clears throat> is because once your application is out in a production environment and you encounter errors, it doesn't matter if you're logging them to the console because this client side, this, your device is elsewhere. It's not in your possession, uh, ideally, right? You, you don't want to be the only install of your application. You want to be able to have multiple multiple people using your application assuming that you're trying to sell the product right this is the final product that you're trying to sell so say you have a user that says hey I uh, I ran into this problem it the application would crash when I would hit this button I mean yeah you can go and set up a test environment and try to figure out what the deal is but if you catch the exception uh, you're able to go and look into that database query the database and look at that stack trace. So ideally this would return, at least in C sharp, that's how you would return. This would uh, take the stack trace. So in this case it would be line 224 in file main.dart. So when you go and debug, you know exactly to just look straight to that. And then if you look in here, you're like, oh, okay. Well, it looks like there could have been a case where it threw an error. And that was a legitimate error. So we caught the exception, logged it. Did, maybe we didn't handle something, right? Maybe we didn't present the user with some data or some screen that said, hey, uh, the input that you passed in caused an error in the application. So you're going to want to handle that. Uh, but that's where the utility is. Again, it's not so big in this little tiny application. I mean, look, it's 300 some lines of code. But when you're working in a huge uh, application, that's where it really comes into play. Like, I, I'll mention that a lot. I'll mention a huge project, but I until you actually work on one, it doesn't really make sense. So I'm, what I'm going to do is um, I use Thani a lot. Thani, the application. It's an open source. Uh, it's an open source Python IDE, Integrated Development Environment. And you can debug just like in Visual Studio Code. It comes with a version of Python. It's very useful for uh, if you want to teach a beginner. You just tell them, hey, install Thani. It comes with Python. They can get to coding right away. But say we want to go and look at the Thani ID source code. If we look at here, notice how there's a whole lot of stuff here, a lot of files. So here's, for example, a shell that has all kinds of logic. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of logic. I get it, some of it may have been automatically generated, but it's probably not going to be automatically generated but this is what you would this is what you would be working with you ideally you'd be working once you get 
out of college once you finish the course. Uh, you're going to go into an enterprise setting. You're going to work with a large code base. Typically, you're not going to be developing something from scratch. So let's find something that... Let's see your first run.py, py. So right here, there's some logic. So when you're working with a code base this large, you know, those F12s really help. Uh, searches, to search through the entire solution, that really helps. But when you're working with something this big, that's where these things come into play because that's a, it makes it a lot easier to find where exactly the problem is when you're working with like a hundred or several hundred files it's, it makes it a lot easier so we wrote the error to the database at least we mocked it we're gonna get into some asynchronous code here and we're done with this actually so we can define an asynchronous function by just giving it this here tag async so in this case we would go and uh, create an instance of the mock database and uh, assign a val uh, variable name here use a constructor fill it up create a new like I said create a new instance but now we want to take the response so we can't just do this we can't just go and say boolean response is equal to uh, in this case we're writing to the table right so we can't just do that uh, if I do this that's also not going to work, just, just so you know. So notice how this here function returns uh, nullable bool. But the thing is that it's, it's wrapped instead of a future. So what the future means is it, it means that it's an, it's, an, it's an awaitable. So in C-sharp, this would actually be a task, a task of type primitive, of type anything, type, type T in that case, because it can, it can be anything. Same deal here. If you return a future of type T, you need to await it. So here the Boolean response is equal to whatever this returns. So let's just try awaiting it. All right, well, that's a problem. Why? Because it could be true or false. It also could be uh, nullable. Could, I'm sorry, not nullable. It could be a null. So to handle that, we're going to go ahead and use a null coalescing. So what we do here is we're going to wait for the response. We're going to send the stuff in, and we're going to await the response. But what happens if this returns null? Well, we don't want a null reference. We could do this, make bool nullable, that would be fine. But later on down the line, we would have to deal with that. So we might as well just deal with it here. In your project, it might be a little different. You might want to deal with that Boolean right before you're going to use it in your uh, code, in your, in your UI, I mean. You might want to deal with it right away and assign it to a primitive non-null. Uh, non <clears throat> but in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to use a null coalescing operator so we're going to wait for the response if the response is true we're going to return we're going to set this to true if the response is false we're going to set this to false if we get null let's just assume it's false we don't want to do this for everything right there might be a case where uh, we want to go and default to true so let's say for example you're taking in a list of user settings a, a list of configurations from a database so you go and load that inside your application and say that you have some permission that is only for administrators we're going to want to probably set that to default to false just because if we set it to default to true we may have we may have unauthorized personnel uh, accessing stuff that we may not want them to access yes you could run it you could jump into the debate of okay well if you're getting a bad api call with no response you're probably not going to be getting any other data that's true you could also have it where someone else is working on the API or you're working with an outside API vendor and in that case you have no control you don't know so you have to prepare for that you have to control that ideally the API vendor would always handle it but you know you they may, they might not always handle it in that case you're going to want to handle it here because if you don't sure it's going to it's going to give you a little pesky message here but that's actually saving you time if you really think about it because it's better to save the time now and to assign a default value rather than to take this code, package it, push it out to production. And then you start getting uh, messages from users or you start getting uh, emails from users saying, hey, why is that breaking when this, happen when this happens? Well, you didn't handle that null. So I mean, in reality, it saves you time because then you're going to have to go gonna have to go and create a pull request. Or, well, not pull request but right away. You're going to have to create a branch if you're using Git. You're going to have to make the change. Sure, it might be a one-liner. You're still going to have to make a change. You're going to have to probably get it reviewed, ideally, right? I get, I get it that not every single um, 
place that you're going to be working at is going to have code reviews, but ideally you're going to have your code reviewed, so that's going to take some time. You're going to wait on another developer to review your code. From there, you're going to have to have that code built. Then you're going to have to deploy it. If you haven't heard the word deploy yet, it means taking your code, building it, and pushing it out to a place where it's going to be stored. So either it's going to be an application, or if you're developing an API, you're going to be deploying an API to a server. Uh, but you're going to have to deploy it then, so that's going to take some time. Then you're going to have to wait to see for you're going to have to wait for people to test, and you know you might have a QC, quality control department, you might not. But all of that can be saved. You can save all that time just by handling it right away. So it's worth it's worth it to spend a little bit of extra time to make sure that your code is safe, make sure that your code is secure, make sure that your code is reliable, make sure that your code is efficient early on rather than dealing with, with what's known as tech debt. That's what that's known as, tech debt, because it might not be costing you anything now, but that does add up over time. And having to go back and rewrite code and refactor code, that co that takes you time, assuming you're making, I don't know, not even gonna throw out any numbers, but you know, the median developer salary in the state of Minnesota, you know, that day or two that you spend doing that, that's time that your employer, that's money that your employer is spending on you. And sure, you might say, well, whatever, that's on my employer. And you're right, right? Because you're not, unless you're self-employed, and the guy, I guess it doesn't really matter to you, but whoever can get the job done fastest and most efficiently right away, those are the people that are most likely going to get the raises, going to get the promotions, so on and so forth. You want to create a high-quality final product. Uh, here, we invoke this method, this function, async operation. I'm going to set a breakpoint. It's not actually going to matter here. Save this here. Hit this button. Hit a breakpoint that I didn't get rid of yet. Let's try that again. So we're going to hit this. We're going to step into. And we're going to create that object there. We're going to wait for the response. It's going to take a little bit of time. I don't know why it sat there and did that multiple times because we only invoked this method or this function once. But as you can tell here, the uh, final value is true. So what actually does this structure do? What does async and await do? So what it basically does is th think of it this way. So you have an instruction pointer. Now this is a very high level programming language, not in terms of complexity, just in terms of it's differ it's difference between this and assembly language and between machine machine code so it's a relatively high le uh, high level language with variables with loops i mean to do something like this in x86 assembly it would take much longer it'd be a lot less straightforward it'd be a lot more convoluted a lot harder to debug so since this is a much higher level language i'll try to make the relation it's not going to be a one to one again but it should mostly make sense so basically, right here, say we have an instruction pointer. It got to this point, it's gonna go and move this value into this variable. The instruction pointer is gonna move on to the next thing, so on and so forth. It's gonna keep doing that continuously. So say that you're running at, I don't know, uh, eight megahertz, right? That's 8,000, 8, sorry, mega. So that would be mega, would be what, one million, something like that is kilo, 1000 mega, so something like that. You all get what I mean. So that's how many cycles per second. So it's going to be doing that. Each one of those cycles is going to be one movement to that instruction pointer, or maybe more if you're doing more logic, but you all get what I mean. It's going to go and correlate with that. Now, when we hit this point, when we await this, all of this is synchronous, so it goes and does this, and then it moves on to the next thing, it moves on to the next thing, it moves on to the next thing, because we get the value, and the value is assigned right away. Once we move on to making a call to an API, reading from a database, or doing any other sort of asynchronous operation, like reading from file storage, like uh, reading from local storage, maybe that's one situation where you might have to wait. But really the biggest ones are database access and API access. You're going to have to await something. So instruction point is going to get to here, then it's going to get to here synchronously. But once it gets to this point, it's going to notice this await, and it's going to wait here. So 
It could be waiting for 10 milliseconds. It could be waiting for 100,000 milliseconds. Uh, but the point is it's not just going to move on to the next thing. Because if it were to do that, then how do you know that? So basically you have a REST API, representational state transfer. You send the payload over to the API. Midway between that payload getting to the API, that's is already moving, a, a cycle has already happened. So it's going to move over to the next one. Well, now the value of this is going to be, we don't know. It's going to be null. It's going to be something. It's going to be junk. So we would have to handle that at that point. So instead of doing that, we could also do what's known as polling, where we could do while, I'm not actually going to write it out, but just the pseudo code would be while this value is null, check it again, and do that as long as you want. But that's taxing on the CPU and on your resources, so that's not typically a... Uh, very good way to handle it. Typically you're going to want to do async await. You may, in production, you may run into what's known as uh, reactive code, where it's it's a different programming paradigm. So instead of having asynchronous blocks of code and awaiting a response from a from a function, you may have it where it's, a, it's, a, it's, known, as, it's known as an observable. Basically, and this observable represents a stream of events and it gets notified. Each time that it gets notified, what's known as a subscription gets uh, fired off. So once that subscription fires off at any point where it's connected to that original observable, that logic would be fired off. It has its advantages. Uh, I work with it personally. I'm not the biggest fan of it. I get it. It has its uses in the marketplace. Uh, but asynchronous code cuts it for 90% of CRUD operations, CRUD being con uh, create, read, update, and delete, which is more than likely what you're going to be in, create, read, update, and delete. You're going to be taking input from a, from a user, going, making it called an API. S inside of that API, some variable is going to be, that variable or variables are going to be stored. Uh, you may read from that API and display it on the screen. You may update an element. You may delete an element. But that's what it comes down to, right? Think of think of like a DMV application, or yeah, that's not a best example because there's probably not too many DMV employees here. But think of a uh, retail software, right? Some retail software where you can go and you can take in new products, and these products have uh, stock keeping units, so SKUs, and uh, they have several other properties like quantity, so on and so forth, that that's what you would be updating basically that's what you would be displaying on the mobile application since flutter is cross-platform it can run on windows it can run on mac you could create an application for mac or for windows just to do like a point of sale system where you would store all of the sales or you'd update the sales so on and so forth so let's get into the assignment uh, so basically for the assignment you're gonna have to work with a map you're gonna have to do some error handling Ensure to use your uh, contains key. Make sure to try and catch stuff. So, like I said, try something, catch that exception. So this is kind of like a kind of like a parameterized anonymous function, I suppose. Something quite similar, where you take that va value and you can use it inside of this function each time this may change. So make sure that you do your exception handling. Other than that, that's about it for this week. Uh, I appreciate you all looking at the video. If you have any questions, make sure you reach out. Thanks for watching.